Hello and welcome to this video on the long non-coding RNA, a distinct but related entity to DNA and RNA, a system that has many strange, unique and interesting functions. Everybody with a basic knowledge of biology understands the process of DNA translating into messenger RNA. This in turn prescribes production of proteins and completion of cellular functions. A relatively simple three-step process that then gives rise to the complexity of life. Long non-coding RNA is another version of RNA that performs a function at the level of DNA. This allows for the regulation of product expression, genome regulation and more. This fits into the well-known large regions of seemingly useless DNA, the so-called junk DNA, regions that may not make obvious products like protein, but could play a role in regulating other DNA functions, or even the development of these long non-coding RNA strands. Long non-coding RNA is a specific version of RNA, it is an RNA sequence of more than 200 nucleotides that does not contribute to a protein product. If it does not produce protein, it must do something. Fortunately, we know a few of the purposes long non-coding RNA serves. They can be grouped into five very broad and overlapping categories. The first and simplest of which is Standalone long non-coding RNA. These are large, distinct units of RNA that do not have any overlap whatsoever with a protein coding gene. There is some thought that they might have overlap with intergenic areas, those are areas between genes. That would explain their believed process, and that is a role in regulation. The way they are structured means they can target different parts of the genome, whether that is promoters or repressor genes. This in turn will either upregulate or downregulate the expression of a variety of products without having to interfere with that product directly. Because they're an RNA strand, they can be specifically tailored to target the specific gene. This is a function similar to what we see in the lab with a PCR test. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, requires a primer that is tailored to match the gene. By having it there, you can promote its repeated transcription, creating many copies. You can imagine why tightly controlling the copying of certain genes and their activity could be important. Imagine what is happening with breast cancer and prostate cancer. Both of these respond positively to sex-specific hormones, specifically testosterone and estrogen. If they were being mass-produced, the body would have a far higher incidence of these cancers than it does presently. Controlling them very carefully is necessary. Now, they require a very different process. But fundamentally, you can think of the same problems occurring if you would not have the same degree of fine control at this level using a long non-coding RNA strand. Even if we are talking about something that could be produced, even without that signal, long non-coding RNAs have a role to play in controlling the various elements of how the products can be modified. This is something called post-transcriptional messenger RNA processing, and it's an essential element for many products the body tries to make. At a cellular level, you may not be able to create a perfect, ideally suited product right out of the DNA. Having modifications done to it afterwards means the cell can adapt it and then use it more effectively a good example of this is the hormone insulin. Insulin is put out of the pancreas, but it has to go through multiple modification steps. 
This allows it to have the tail removed, which leaves you with a still incomplete insulin molecule, which then gets hydrolyzed, which allows it to then become insulin that is functional in the way we know it. It's these multiple steps that allow it to be built up and then broken down in the appropriate manner, all of which also need to be regulated. Remembering that due to the size and nature of the long non-coding RNA, it has to bind to its complementary counterpart. That means it has to be very specific and can more effectively interfere with its production and effect. If we are talking about the production process of products within the cell, we need to look at the role of messenger RNA and how long non-coding RNA can interfere with this. Messenger RNA is made by translating DNA once the helix has been unwound and the twin nucleotides in that helix are exposed. Each of them should match. They have their complement. If you were to have long non-coding RNA that matches the gene being translated, you would find that the complexes involved were unable to get into that helix, accessing that gene, and then translate it, because the long non-coding RNA, which should match it in a complementary manner, was preventing it from getting in there and doing what it's meant to do. This is especially true when certain sides of the DNA strand are more favoured over the other. This owes to the nature of the directionality of gene translation and DNA translation in general. That would interfere with the messenger RNA. Now in some cases, it could be possible that interfering with production of the messenger RNA is what helps it to perform its functionality. There are specific genes that if they are interfered with and certain regions are modified via something like long non-coding RNA, it creates a more efficient translation of it. In other cases, it completely interferes with it. This owes to an anti-sense change that means the entire gene no longer makes sense, and the triple codon just fails. This sort of modification can be especially important and useful when we're looking at the diversity of receptors and functionality of the human body. A good case would be the antigens on immune cells. They need to be able to identify and respond to a wide range of possible targets. Creating random changes along the way could be done a number of ways. The most common being genetic changes at the DNA level. But when we're looking at more common and stable receptor structures, they aren't so easily fiddled with. A good example of that is one of the thyroid hormone receptors, which has two different isoforms, and changing it using RNA allows you to create those two different forms from a single gene. We've spoken about this in a manner of speaking so far, but long non-coding RNA can have a function as a silencing RNA. That is an RNA that completely blocks out the use of a gene. If one gene is dependent on an upstream regulator or depressor to be able to function, modifying that upstream action may encourage or completely stop a gene from being expressed. It may also require secondary actors to be in place, a sort of intermediary before that gene can be used or activated. If you can block that using a long non-coding RNA, you might find that it has the effect of either making a pathology occur or treating something. This is currently being investigated when it comes to the Y chromosome, males, and the higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. This can also play a role in stopping the spread of transposons. The human genome can be a tedious and fickle creature at times. Transposons are an example of this, especially when we're talking about germline cells. If you want to prevent a gene from moving from one location to another, then you need to have it somehow stuck there. Long non-coding RNA, in this case, kind of acts like a staple, locking it in place, but it's not so substantial as to prevent it from moving long term. 
if something comes along that forces the long non-coding RNA to move away from that location, the transposon can begin to move around freely again. This can be especially useful in things that require a highly variable genome. Good examples are the previously mentioned immune cells that need to be shuffled around to create new possible variations that can provide immunity for the human host. Something we have mentioned and that should be built on further in the future is the role of long non-coding RNA and imprinting. Imprinting can be done a number of ways, and we have previously discussed DNA methylation as an example of just that. The idea is that the DNA strand matches with another compound. In the case of DNA methylation, it's a methyl group that prevents the movement and functionality of mechanisms that copy or translate that particular part of the genome. This can be useful in the case of women who have two X chromosomes. Because they have two X chromosomes, one of them needs to be turned off, or else you get an overexpression of certain genes. Therefore, imprinted genes generally get clustered together in certain places, where they are found by themselves or in isolation, you need a mechanism to prevent their expression, and these RNAs can play a role in that, or at least in preventing upstream and downstream effectors from activating those genes. This could be that the long non-coding RNA has a role to play in either activating the systems that imprint these genes, or in removing that imprinting so that at least one of them is active. Primarily, their role is there to facilitate the imprinting, but not necessarily to be the imprinting itself. The X chromosome specific example may be perhaps one of the major deviations from that rule. It requires chromatin modification of the inactivated X chromosome. This modification prevents certain actions from occurring. This is facilitated through the loss of the H3K9 histone via acetylation and the H3K4 due to methylation. These are both involved with activation of chromatin. By removing them, there is an induced repression of the chromatin modifications that would allow it to open up. If the chromatin can't be used in a normal manner, you can't access those genes and they can't express a product. This thereby prevents any transcription or translation of the X-linked genes on that chromosome. There are also a number of non-coding RNAs that are expressed to counteract this effect on the X chromosome that has not been silenced. These exist to prevent any particular fallout from one chromosome being silenced affecting the second. This is done through the use of an antisense transcript and this allows for future activation of the same chromosome that is already active as a sort of a protective mechanism. This ensures that at least in a female mammal, only one X chromosome is active at any given time. Based on what you've seen and heard so far, this information should give you some idea about the extra layer of gene regulation that long non-coding RNA gives. It acts as an intermediary inhibitor or facilitator that sits somewhere between DNA and RNA as far as RNA's production of products or facilitation of cellular functionality is concerned. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.